Uh, please open your Bibles to Psalm 49. Our lesson will be taken from the book of Psalms tonight. Psalm 49, we'll get there in a moment. <clears throat> Uh, February is a time when we think um, a lot about money, actually. We think about money in February. You know, we're getting our W-2s ready, we're getting all those receipts back, related paperwork in order to prepare our tax returns. Oh, happy day, tax return season is coming. And of course, this yearly exercise you know, reminds us of, well, it reminds us of how much we've earned uh, this year, how much in taxes we have to pay, how much we've donated, so on and so forth, it really forces us to kind of look at our financial situation. And I would say that this would be an opportune time for the preacher uh, to talk about giving, to talk about uh, you know, things financial, but I'd rather kind of tackle another issue that relates to our attitude about money. In Psalm 49, uh, David gives uh, good financial advice to those who are envying the wealth of their brothers, of their neighbors. And in this passage, he reminds them of the things that money cannot buy. And this is what I want to focus on this evening, what money cannot buy. So let's go to verse, or, or Psalm 49 and read the first uh, couple of verses. He writes, hear this, all peoples, give ear, all inhabitants of the world, both low and high, rich and poor together. My mouth will speak wisdom, and the meditation of my heart will be understanding. I will incline my ear to a proverb. I will express my riddle on the harp. So in the first couple of verses, the writer calls on everyone to listen to his teaching, that it will be beneficial to both rich and poor and that each will have something to learn. And so it's a kind of a, hey, heads up, pay attention, I'm going to teach you something, uh, for, uh, the, verse, uh, the first couple of verses says. And then he goes ahead to list the limits of money, uh, beginning in verse five. He says, why should I fear in the days of adversity when the iniquity of my foes surrounds me? Even those who trust in their wealth and boast in the abundance of their riches, no man can by any means redeem his brother or give to God a ransom for him, for the redemption of his soul is costly and he should cease trying forever, that he should live, uh, that he should live on eternally, that he should not undergo uh, decay. So the very first thing he talks about, as far as money is concerned, what money can't buy, is that money cannot buy your soul. Now money can do a lot of things, but it has no power whatsoever in the, in the spiritual realm. Wealth is no advantage in going to heaven. If I were to kind of summarize the few verses that he, that he says here, that he writes. And David gives the reason for this. There is just not enough money to equal the value of a, of a human soul. Souls cannot be exchanged for money, cannot be exchanged for good works, prayers, piety, nothing can be exchanged for a person's soul. He even says, you know, stop trying. Stop making the effort to try to exchange something for your soul. A soul, he says, is made in the image of God, and so it needs something of equal or like value to purchase it or to exchange for it. This is why Jesus offered His perfect life for our souls. His perfect godly soul exchanged for our soul, soul for soul, spirit for spirit. And so the first thing that David mentions that money cannot buy is a person's soul. And then he talks about a second thing that money cannot buy, and that is time. Money cannot buy time. Let's keep reading from verse 10. He says, for he sees that even wise men die. The stupid and the senseless alike perish and leave their wealth to others. Their inner thought is that their houses are forever and their dwelling places to all generations. They have called their lands after their own names, but man in his pomp will not endure. He is like the beasts that perish. 
This is the way of those who are foolish and of those after them who approve their words. As sheep they are appointed for Sheol, death shall be their shepherd, and the upright shall rule over them in the morning, and their form shall be for Sheol to consume, so that they have no habitation. So we know that money, you know, money can buy a good time, you can, you, know, you can buy a good time with money, but you cannot buy time itself with money, and there's the difference. David says that wealthy people think that their wealth can somehow extend their time. They think that they will live on through their possessions somehow, even mentions they call their lands after their name. You know, people put their names on buildings. Somehow that's going to buy them some time. They build monuments to themselves thinking that their presence through these in the eyes of future generations will somehow equal some type of existence for themselves, there are entire religions based on this idea that you, know, you can keep on going somehow. They think that they can buy time through technology. In those days it was through wealth and through the, the amount of things that you own. Nowadays you know, we think that we can do that through technology. A great example, you know, Walt Disney, remember Walt Disney, um, and the science uh, or the practice of cryonics, cryonics is you know, low temperature, cold temperature. Basically, Walt Disney had himself frozen, you know what I mean, and kept with the thought that perhaps some time into the future, some technical breakthrough, some medical breakthrough would heal or repair the body or the thing that had taken his, his life. You know, he thought technology somehow would buy him more time. He didn't realize that you die one time and then comes the judgment. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27, I believe. So David says that the wealthy die, and they remain dead, and separate from the living, just like everyone else. The smart people die, the rich people die, the poor people die, foolish, everybody dies, everybody. Nobody can beat death. So to think that money buys time is foolish. And to believe so only reveals another thing that money doesn't buy, and that is wisdom. A third thing he mentions in verse 16 uh, is the fact that money does not buy power over death. So let's read beginning in verse 16. He says, do not be afraid when a man becomes rich, when the glory of his house is increased, for when he dies he will carry nothing away. His glory will not descend after him. Though while he lives, he congratulates himself, and though men praise you when you do well for yourself, he shall go to the generation of his fathers. They will never see the light. Man in his pomp, yet without understanding, is like the beasts that perish. So money cannot buy you power over death. Not only is money useless in trying to purchase more time, it's powerless in turning away the grim reaper, as they say. And not only is money powerless in turning away death, it is also useless to you when you die and after you die. I've mentioned this several times in other lessons, you know, but people that I've visited on their deathbeds in hospitals you know, who knew that they were close to dying, the last thing they ever wanted to talk about was money. They never wanted to you know, know, you know, could you, could you remind me, could you, do you have your iPad with you, Mike? Could you go into my bank account and check you know, if my checks went through? Or how much interest my bonds have earned? They're not interested in that at all. It's the furthest thing from their minds at the moment where they will face death because they realize that their money, their wealth, their power cannot save them from that very important moment. Now there may be a difference in the quality of life between the rich and the poor, but there is no difference in the quality of their death. At death, everyone is stripped of their wealth, no matter how much wealth they have. So regardless of what they say about you when you die, it won't matter to you anymore after you're gone. You know, when I do a funeral, after it's over, you know, everyone you know, kind of begins to talk about this and that, and you know, they, 
they, they, they get together and go eat. We have wonderful people in this congregation that organize you know, dinners for the family and the family comes back to eat and everybody you know, gets in their cars and drives away, except for one person. And that's the person they're going to put in the ground. That person doesn't go on. That person is beyond caring anymore. That person is beyond appetite anymore. And so David calls out to those who are tempted or discouraged by the wealth of other people in comparison to their own poverty. And he reminds them that wealth has some pretty restrictive limits. Money is good and it has power, but not enough power to do the things that are truly important to all men, to all people. Those things are attainable by all, rich and poor, but not by wealth. All right, so that's, those are some of the things that, and obvious things uh, that you can see that money cannot buy. Let's, let's look at some of the things that money can buy. You know, we rarely hear from the pulpit things that money can buy. And money can buy some things. Don't want you to get the wrong idea. I'd like to mention some of the things that money can do. And money can buy things with a clear conscience. Paul says that it's the love of money that is the root of all evil, 1 Timothy chapter six. You know, we, I've heard that passage misquoted so many times. You know, money is the root of all evil. No, it's not. Money is not moral. It's amoral. It's not good or bad. It's just a thing. It's the love of money, the inordinate love of money. That's the root of evil. Money all by itself is neutral and can be used for good things as well as bad things. So what can money buy? Well, first of all, money can buy comfort and freedom and opportunity. It's no secret that one of the basic uses of money is to provide for our needs and provide opportunities for education, for self-expression, for travel and freedom from the worry over paying bills. That's a good thing. I don't know about you, but I feel good when I've paid off uh, my car or when a, I've paid off a bill or isn't it a wonderful day when you make your last house payment and you own your house? Wow, you're, boy, you're anxious to sign that check and send it along. So you know, money can give you a, a, a legitimate happy feeling. And this is usually the level that most of us are striving for in our careers and in our handling of money. This is a, a good use of money so long as we know when enough is enough and not get caught in the sin of greed where you know, we never have enough and we spend our lives always building bigger and bigger barns or saving just a little bit more just in case. When the focus of our life becomes simply the gathering and the holding on of money in case something happens, Things happen, yes, but it isn't money that sustains us in life, it's God that sustains us in life. So the use of money is good to buy ourselves freedom and you know, uh, freedom from indebtedness, a comfortable life. Who doesn't want to provide a good education for their children or perhaps help their parents and so on and so forth. Another thing that money can be uh, used for in a good way, money can be used to better the world. I mean, many people who have uh, avoided the trap of greed have discovered that a wonderful way to use money is to make improvements in the world, in the surroundings where they are. Some wealthy people realize that there's, you know, there's just so much you can eat, so much you can drink, there's so many places you can go, there's just so much pleasure that comes from making money they begin to use their wealth to make this world a better place to live in. You know what I'm saying? I mean, most of us here, I think, we, we're living you know, thinking, I got to pay this, I got to pay that, I'm going to do some overtime, I hope I don't lose my, we're, we're living paycheck to paycheck, you know, not too much of a cushion, but what happens if you've got a $20 million cushion? You can only still eat only three meals a day and the, you know, only so many vacations you can take. Eventually, you, know, you start wondering, surely there's got to be something else I can do with this money other than just spend it on myself. Ted Turner, if you remember him, uh, Turner Broadcasting, you know, he owns CNN and you know, he's a multimillionaire. Pretty hard-nosed businessman, yet every year he loses money 
on the goodwill games, you know, for handicapped athletes, but he gains great satisfaction from doing this good work. He knows that it's not going to make money for him. That's not why he does it. He does it because the doing of it with his money gives him great satisfaction and he sees the good that it does. Bill Gates, former Microsoft chairman, says that for the rest of his life, his goal is to give away most of his fortune. He's a billionaire. And so he's, you know, he's busy. His, his whole focus now is to find strategic, profitable ways of giving away his fortune to better the lives of other, of other people. Totally focused on that. So these are, you know, there are many examples of great and um, you know, small people who, who give their time and money and skills to helping and building, coaching, supporting different causes that will leave this world a better place. Not everybody's a billionaire, but a lot of people volunteer to coach teams, volunteer to help at the hospital, whatever, because they recognize that there's value in giving and helping uh, people around them. They've learned uh, a use of wealth that brings great satisfaction and that has nothing to do with profit or money or advantage. So what can money buy? It can buy the satisfaction that comes with doing good. So money can do that. And you don't have to be a millionaire to do that. You know, all the people who donate blood, they're giving, they're giving their own blood so that someone else uh, will live. Someone else will have an opportunity to have better, better health. And that's, that's a satisfying activity. And then another thing that money can be used for is to buy treasure in heaven. Money can be used to buy treasure in heaven. Now this may sound like the use that I've just mentioned, but it's not. You know, about people, you know, Bill Gates and those people, they're not buying treasure in heaven. They're trying to make this world a better place, and that's fine. That's a noble and worthy occupation. But it's not buying treasure in heaven. Jesus taught that a man is lost if he lays up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God, Luke 12, 21. Gaining wealth for oneself is all right, but it has no effect on our soul. Using wealth for others is good in that it purchases for us the satisfaction that naturally comes from doing good. But you have to understand that the satisfaction that you get from doing that, that's your full reward. That's it, that's what you get from that. And that's a good reward. You feel good because you've helped out and you've, you know, you've donated to the Red Cross or whatever. In Matthew 19, 21, Jesus says to the rich young ruler, if you wish to be complete, go and sell your possessions and give to the poor and you shall have treasure in heaven and come, follow me. Do you see the connection there? He had to go and give away his money to the poor. And Jesus says, and you'll have treasure in heaven. And then he says, come follow me. You see, the use of money for others without reference to Christ gains no advantage for the soul. Giving his money to the poor made him complete. In other words, it demonstrated that he understood the very best and most mature use of wealth. But this action, coupled with faith in Jesus Christ, that opened up for him the benefits of a heavenly reward. It became treasure in heaven because he did it based on his faith in Jesus Christ. That's the difference. In another passage, Jesus says that if even a cup of water is given in His name, the giver will not lose his reward, Mark 9, verse 41. The point here is that what, what transforms our giving into spiritual treasure is its relationship to Jesus Christ. That's the important thing that we need to remember. We can give away a treasure for a good cause, but unless we give it in the name of Jesus, it will not create for us treasure in heaven. It will create for us treasure here on earth, our name on a building, 
great satisfaction, the appreciation of many people, the respect of people for our generosity and so on and so forth. And these are, you know, they're rewards. But they are rewards that remain here on earth. They are rewards that are buried with us when we go. Unless it is given in the name of Christ for the purpose of Christ, unless it is done because of faith in Him, it has no bearing on our life, our spiritual life, or the treasure we have in heaven. You know, we, uh, we spend most of our waking hours trying to make money, or use money, or we worry about money. Our lesson tonight reminds us of a few important things about money. First of all, there are important things that money cannot do. It can't lengthen one's life by a single second. It can't make one's life more valuable and it cannot preserve one's life from death. These are the traps and lies that people who seek wealth are drawn by and eventually ruined by. Secondly, what you do with your money is a reflection of what you do with your life. You can't use fake religion or church attendance as a cover for greed or selfishness or poor stewardship of your money. At judgment, God will look more closely at your checkbook than your attendance record. Because in looking at your checkbook, He'll know where your priorities really were while you were alive here on earth. And then thirdly, the cross of Jesus Christ buys us what we really need what we really need. Money cannot buy time, cannot buy a soul, cannot buy a reprieve from death. All things that every single one of us needs so desperately. But the blood of Jesus Christ does. This is what David alludes to in verse 15. I close my Bible a little too fast here. Verse 15, David writes, but God will redeem my soul from the power of Sheol, for He will receive me. He will receive me. The sacrifice of Jesus buys for me forgiveness for my sins, buys for me freedom from the second death, buys for me eternal life with God. And the beauty of all this is that it is available to everyone regardless of their wealth because it is received by faith, a faith initially expressed in repentance and baptism. Okay, so let's remember then to buy the right things with our money and to use it in the way God intends for us to use it. And irregardless of how much or little money we do have, Let's also realize that God's offer of the things that money cannot buy are available to everyone here tonight who are ready to receive them through faith. So there is a treasure, there is a treasure waiting to be received by each individual that Christ calls. If you want treasure in heaven, then I encourage you to come to Jesus this evening in repentance and baptism, or perhaps for prayers, or perhaps for restoration. You may have simply cast this treasure aside because of you know, foolishness or sinfulness or neglect. And if that's the case, if you need to once more come back to Christ, retake what is yours, what God has offered to you freely, then we do encourage you to come forward now as we stand and as we sing our song of encouragement.